So welcome everyone to my talk at last. And let's get ready to rumble. So the ultimate fight between Artos and, of course, bare metal. So my name is Frédéric Desbien, or Fred. I manage IoT and edge computing programs at the Eclipse Foundation, which essentially means that I need to work with working groups and projects that build IoT building blocks or complete platforms for edge computing. And it's my great pleasure to be with you today. So this presentation, of that, that's funny because I was looking for a snazzy title and of course, uh, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, this has a ring to it. And, and when you think about it, there shouldn't have been any suspense about that particular fight. You have a godlike creature versus a billionaire, so of course the billionaire wins. Okay. <laughs> In any case, I, I never saw the movie, <laughs> so I just borrowed the title. So, you know, if you felt uh, I have bad taste in movies, don't worry, uh, that's not the case. So, uh, today our agenda. Um, we'll take a step back and uh, try to think for ourselves, okay, um, is there a need for us or our real-time OSs? Why would not we need such a thing? And, and that's really important because if you try to contrast approaches, you need to properly define them. Then uh, we'll have a look at three specific open source RT OSs. There are plenty of those in the commercial world. I don't care about those. Okay, so just good open source stuff. And then uh, we'll have a look at the bare metal approach. So once again, mostly open source uh, approaches to bare metal. Of course, there are plenty more that I'm not covering there. I, I needed to pick, right? But the whole point here is not to be exhaustive about your options. The whole point here is to give you, you know, rules of thumbs, tips, things to think about in making this choice for your particular project. All right? So let's get started. Do we need real-time OSs? Uh, this is dating a bit myself. This is my first computer, or rather a photo of one like mine. You know, I've lost mine a while back. But anyway, um, you know, there are plenty of applications where you don't necessarily need even an operating system. This machine is a good example. It was running straight to the basic interpreter. Never had to put a patch on that. Completely reliable. Um, of course, the capacities were quite limited, right? What you could do with that, but still. Um, so for that particular type of application, just running a basic interpreter and run my programs and a few games and things like that, this was perfectly reliable and fine. You didn't need an OS on such a thing. Now, okay, if you're from the younger crowd, I would, I would tell you, okay, uh, I'm dating myself with that, and of course, but be wary of any evil Commodore 64 user, okay? So that's one thing to ask to other people like myself. Uh, so, of course, in the modern world, the equivalent of this would be a microcontroller, right? It's good. <laughs> Most very tiny micro microcontrollers have capacities roughly similar to what you see in there. You know, a few, one, a few dozen megahertz processor, maybe 64 or 128 kilobytes of memory, or even smaller, and, and things like that. And so, uh, ultimately, if it would have been a good fit on a computer like that, it's probably a good fit on a microcontroller today, and then uh, you don't necessarily need an OS, but maybe you do. Maybe you do, and that's what we will explore. Um, so, taking a step back, of course, if you need to decide on whether you need an OS or not, you have to factor in what OSs typically provide. And the first on the list really are APIs, and, and that's the main reason why you would need one. You know, Microsoft Windows strictly became okay, uh, uh, industry juggernaut for one and only one reason. What is it, do you think? Was it the best OS, technically speaking? No. Was it the most beautiful OS? No. Apps. People wanted to run Office. Okay, and that's why it sold. And that's why it's sold. So APIs, generally speaking, are our way to make applications run. So if your OS offers API that people want to exploit, then they will run your OS. 
It's as simple as that, right? And APIs have this power of simplifying our own code as developers. They are pretty useful. They are accelerators for us because we don't need to implement everything. Then, of course, there's the whole domain of hardware support, right? Uh, you don't want to write drivers yourself. So if you have hardware to support, you want to leverage those capabilities in your program, then, of course, using an operating system or something that provides hardware support is the way to go. Uh, memory management. This is a tricky one, right? You don't want to write your own memory management routines, at least if you are a run-of-the-mill developer like myself. So once again, OSs typically take that into account for you. Multitasking, same thing, right? Getting multiple things going on at once, okay? Of course, um, you can manually implement such things yourself, but it's rather preferable to de delegate that to people that in theory know what they are doing. That's not always the case, but uh, that's another compelling advantage of operating systems. Now, um, from a multitasking perspective, of course, uh, you, your specific use case does not necessarily need to run multiple tasks at once, right? If I'm building a weather station or a multi-sensor device, you know, where a light with sensors in it to report environmental data, well, it will do only that, so I don't need to multitask. So, you know, once again, weighting your options there is really important. And finally, um, there are uh, the real-time requirements and shared services that you may need. So, when we talk about real-time requirements, okay, we're talking about real, real real-time here. And what does that mean? Well, if you speak to industry people working on PLCs or industrial machines or nuclear or power plants or things like that, and you tell them, oh, you want to do real time, we can use Linux, you know, they are the preempt RT patches and you can use that. And they will look at you and say, no, that's not true real time. Okay, so when we say real time, this is absolutely guaranteed latency for an operation. Okay. And that's really important because in the case of Linux, not every driver, for example, is even compatible with the preempt RT patches or other real-time things that are, they are in the ecosystem. So real-time requirements in the context of this presentation are hard real-time requirements. You know, you know the, ABS, the microcontroller driving the ABS brakes in my car. Okay, they need to react in 10 milliseconds or, or maybe less, uh, Andy, maybe... Uh, Maybe you have the value in mind. Anyway, um, you know, there's a definite delay for it to execute. And, and of course, using a real-time OS is not enough in that context. It's just the bare minimum, because if I write bad code, maybe the operation, even if the OS guarantees latency, that won't be enough, because my code is too lazy and, and, and not performant enough. So, but at least in, this, in the domain of real-time, having a true real-time OS is certainly the way to fulfill the requirement. And then there are all the shared services that OSs provide, like printing, uh, cryptography, etc. All of those things, of course, can be implemented separately, but it's convenient when you have a, a base a set of shared services that are predictable from one environment to another. Now, there are several types of operating systems, as uh, we mentioned, but the two main ones are really time sharing versus real time. And time sharing, once again, I'm, I'm dating myself, but really on your phone, on your laptop, on your smartwatch, you are running a time sharing operating system, which means essentially you're slicing and dicing your hardware to maximize utilization, to extract the maximum performance out of it, to run as many tasks in parallel as possible, to provide interactivity and, generally speaking, uh, smoothness for the end user. So that's one type. But the real real-time OSs, this is about latency, as I said, and that's a really important distinction. Now, there's also, in terms of requirement, whether you are more building for IT versus building for OT. And when we say OT, operational technology, okay, this is about robots in a factory. This is about uh, automating the power grid. This is about uh, a domain, essentially, where you have, yes, you have computers, yes, you have networks, but you have a completely different mindset. You know, how often do you think that the people at Aldi will throw away all the machinery in a factory and then replace everything with modern alternatives. 
every 20 years, every 25 years. That doesn't happen very often. But why? Because this is very expensive, and every second not passed, not invested in making something, in building something, is wasted revenue. Okay? You stop a factory like that, just an afternoon, and you have lost 10 million euros. Okay? So, this is a domain where the developers are really obsessed about keeping things running. Patches are not frequent. You try to keep equipment running for as long as possible because they are huge capital investments. Compare that to the world of IT. We throw away laptops every three years and we replace everything. And we install a new version every two weeks of something and no problem. Well, you have to bridge the, that gap between the two in IoT and edge computing projects, right? And so it's really important, especially if you are like me from the IT side, to be sensitive to the mindset of OT-minded people because essentially IoT and edge projects are much more OT than they are IT at, at the core. And that's really important. So how would you decide between bare metal and uh, RTOS? Three main points there. There, are, there could be many more, but I tried you know, to keep this simple and focused. So first, what kind of hardware are you leveraging? You know, does it come with already RTOS or a suggested set of RTOS alternatives or not? Okay? And of course, um, the hardware platform and all the peripherals on, on the other end that you, that you would use, right? Because um, probably if you have sensors, actuators, all sorts of devices that you will want to plug, you need to ensure that either you, call, you can code directly for them or that you can access them in a, in a meaningful uh, fashion. You don't want to pass time and, and invest effort to develop on your own a hardware abstraction layer or hardware, uh, hardware, abstraction co uh, hardware access code, because this is error prone, this is fragile, and this is something that you will have to maintain probably for the next 5, 10, and 15 years. Don't forget, IoT and edge computing projects, you know, you're, you're putting sensors on every wind turbine in Germany. Okay, well, you won't replace that every six months, so that means you need to run for five, 10, 15 years, okay, in, in that state, and so support that in your software over time. And finally, what are your requirements? Do you have hard real-time requirements or not? Okay, this is, of course, a very important consideration. So now let's have a look uh, slightly technical look, but not too deep, at three RTOS options. And the first one that I chose here is ARM Embed. Okay, ARM Embed is open source, and this is not even the full picture. Okay, I cut voluntarily to keep things a bit simple, the part about trusted hardware and things like that, and so they have uh, special security extensions and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I cut that a bit, but the core OS is certainly uh, open source and very interesting. So, of course, um, parts of the components, and you, and you see that at the bottom of the diagram, platform drivers, timers, all of that, are delivered through what they call a board support pack, which means they work with NXP and other Nordic or whoever uh, in order to provide the drivers and low-level stuff that you need to really leverage the full capacities of a board, right? But at least, and those board support packs are not always open source, so you know the core OS is, but then you have to figure out what the options are for the specific hardware that you have. But in terms of functionality, if you look at this diagram, this is quite comprehensive. You can run ARM Embed as an RTOS or not, okay? So uh, if you have simpler needs. And then uh, it comes with its own little uh, uh, constraint device optimized uh, file system. It's got a full uh, suite of security APIs, so support for TLS, DTLS, cryptography, and even implementations for co-op, MQTT, and other protocols built in. So that's quite attractive. And of course, um, what happens is uh, you also have this hardware abstraction layer in it, which means that in theory, if you're writing for some specific ARM core, you would be able to port fairly easily to other cores because of that abstraction layer in the OS. So once again, that's a good way to keep uh, your software alive on the long term. Now, okay, 
embed versus your project, is it up to snuff? Well, the pros of embed is that it's very modular, so whatever, depending on the features you pick, Okay, the, the executable will be larger, but you won't, you won't have anything that you're not actively using in your application, so that's good. It's got an abstraction layer, and of course, great ARM support. MQTT and CoAP are built in, and very mature cryptography, so all of that are pros. But then, the problem with Embed is that this is single vendor governance. In other words, this is ARM's baby, this is not under a foundation, which means you are at the mercy of ARM. Whether, and I'm not saying that ARM is a nefarious corporation or anything. They are a great uh, partner of the Eclipse Foundation. They are a member, but you have to figure out in, to your plans in the sense that their roadmap may not align with yours. Okay, and that's really important. And then, of course, embed is relatively popular, but compared to other options, is as a smaller ecosystem. And that's another consideration if you want to recruit developers experienced with it, if you want to find resources online or that kind of stuff. Second option, the juggernaut, uh, FreeRTOS. So FreeRTOS compared to Embed is quite simpler. You know, this diagram is very really legible. So that's good. Um, you have the core kernel, you have a set of libraries and simple implementations for most of the widely used stuff. So a full TCP IP stack, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth support, TLS, so that's all great. And then you see those little dotted boxes that I put in there. So over-the-air updates, device defender, device shadow. So those things are nice and you have even open source client implementations for them in the, in the FreeRTOS uh, GitHub uh, repos, but they are tied to AWS backends. So, of course, you could develop your own backend replicating the API. Ha ha ha, yeah, yeah, very productive. Don't do that, okay? All of this to say, this is, you know, um, since the AWS acquisition, let's say, of FreeRTOS, you have this feeling that they're trying to nudge you in a specific direction. So, uh, still, it's certainly something that's widely used in the industry and, and worth of your attention. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it, but you should be aware that there are some political considerations or business considerations at play in the, back here, uh, in the background. Um, and, and, and you see here in, in, the, in the fully uh, supported uh, uh, FreeRTOS stack, you have an implementation for MQTT and HTTPS as well. However, that's the thing. When you go on the GitHub for FreeRTOS, okay, uh, you will see that there are things that, are, that come from the core team and maintained by them. Others that have been accepted by the core team from some of their partners, and after that, things that are maintained by partners, and after that, things that are not really maintained apart from the community. And all of that is intermixed, and you have no idea what you are facing unless you write everything that's written. So, when you go the FreeRTOS route, the potential danger is that, okay, you have the latest FreeRTOS version, so you are secure, but maybe the other components you need to cobble together in order to build your application, they won't necessarily be as well maintained as the others. And that's, well, that's a risk. That's a risk, certainly. So, should you pick FreeRTOS? Well, it's got a very small footprint and it's very mature and it's got very broad uh, hardware support. It's been around for quite a while, so that's good. Vast ecosystem of uh, partners in there that um, ensure that their boards and chips are supported by FreeRTOS. But once again, single vendor governance. And uh, not only that, but there's this support burden, so not every component that you may find online may benefit from the same level of support. And of course, the growing ties to the AWS cloud. And some of the features, like they have five versions of dynamic memory allocation in there. All are shipped as samples. Oh yes, that's very reassuring. I will trust the life of somebody else on a memory allocation sample. So you need, depending on your level of comfort of dealing with these low level type of issues, you may want to look at alternatives or not, maybe you will be comfortable with that. But that's something to, you know, to pay close attention to. 
Last but not least is uh, Zephyr from the Linux Foundation. Uh, so uh, Zephyr is a comprehensive uh, option with support for MQTT, lightweight M2M, HTTP, and co-op, full security, um, and is built in a very modular and hierarchical way, as you can see uh, on the slide. It supports most of the ports you will find on typical microcontrollers, I2C, SPI, UART, uh, GPIO, and everything. And so in terms of feature set, this is quite similar to what we were seeing in the case of Embed. So, should you pick Zephyr for your project? Well, it's modular, it's mature, uh, it's been contributed uh, around 2017, 16, I don't remember the exact date, uh, to the Linux Foundation, but it existed before that, okay, and has been open sourced. Uh, by, by its owners at the time. And, and the ecosystem is really growing. You can see that if you check this, uh, the, the statistics on their GitHub, uh, more contributors, more commits all the time. So it's really on the uptick. Uh, it's a bit heavier, of course, than FreeRTOS, but it delivers uh, more features. Um, and for the time being, the hardware support is maybe a bit more limited, but this is improving over time as people join the ecosystem. And in my opinion, the one main advantage of Zephyr is the vendor neutral governance. The fact that it's under the Linux Foundation means that no one can take over the project and run with it or nudge you towards a specific cloud or anything like that. Okay, so now we're done with our tosses. Uh, let's have a look at a few contenders for the title of bare metal heavyweight in this battle. So, of course, uh, some microcontrollers uh, ship without an OS and can run code straight away. A popular example of that is Arduino. Um, Arduino is not the only game in town, but it's certainly a very popular one, and that's why I picked it. So typically, you will find there microcontrollers using 8-bit or 16-bit RISC cores with or even without a bootloader. So in the case of Arduinos, you can decide, OK, I need a few more extra Ks of storage because my program is a, a little overweight, like me. So um, I will nuke the bootloader and, and do the flashing myself, okay? So you can do that. Um, the programs execute directly, typically on such microcontrollers. So in the case of Arduino, they are called sketches, which is a simplified version of C++, but uh, fairly uh, fully featured. And uh, what's nice about that type of environment, of course, is that there's an extensive set of libraries supporting various technologies like MQTT and REST built by the community and open source. So, pros and cons for that approach, well, this is very simple. So, for anything that's just about gathering sensor data, sending it somewhere, that's a very reliable option. The footprint is very small, the devices are affordable, but no multitasking, no real-time guarantees, and the code is platform-specific. So, in the case of Arduino, you're making sketches which are a bit quiet, but not completely unlike C++, so that porting that to something else may be troublesome, especially since the libraries re you rely on may not be available on other environments, okay? So, you know, up to you to decide if that's good for you, but you have to be aware of the cons before going all in on an approach like that. Then there is something like the Espressive IoT Development Fra Framework, or IDF. So uh, in that case, this is a fully featured thing, uh, but it supports only their ESP32 MCU, which is a pr pretty good one. I mean, it comes with two processor cores, 32-bit ones, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, and they are widely available in the market and fairly cheap, so that's a very good uh, piece of hardware for sure. Uh, what's nice about IDF is that it supports HTTP and MQTT out of the box, and even Modbus, so interesting if you need to integrate with machinery. And it can even instantiate HTTP and HTTPS servers, so if you want to get fancy and get a web server in the field on this very tiny board, you can. Okay, great. You can even use uh, FreeRTOS, uh, in the case of IDF, as the scheduler, so you will schedule the various tasks in uh, FreeRTOS style while still keeping access to the full set of libraries. But they modified, this is a fork of FreeRTOS, so they modified it to support SMP since the MCU has two cores and that kind of stuff. So uh, it may not track as accurately the, 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 main, uh, the main branch of the FreeRTOS repo because of that there is some latency in the process. 
Okay? So pros and cons there, well, it's simple, it multitasks, real-time is a possibility, the devices are affordable, but uh, the ASP32 is only from Espressif, so, well, uh, that's certainly a nice piece of hardware and company, but single supplier is uh, a certain risk in any market. Then uh, the extensa cores on there, they are risk, but they are not ARM, they are not risk five. So, of course, uh, support is a bit more limited because of that. And, of course, uh, if we're talking about microcontrollers, you don't need 64 or even 32-bit for every application. But in the case of the ESP32, that's in the name, that's what you get. 32 bits, whether you want them or not. Um, and then comes Rust. Uh, the Rust ecosystem is uh, increasingly interested in embedded development. And this is a significant uh, trend there because Rust is very attractive given its feature set for constraint devices. It provides you memory safety, thread safety out of the box at compile time. So no race conditions, no buffer overflows out of the box. That's quite a sweet deal if you ask me. Uh, of course, you have to put up with the language, you, which you may love or not. In my case, I'm just dabbing in it. Uh, you know, as a program manager, I can't uh, really code on a daily basis. So uh, my personal interest in it doesn't reflect the daily pain of uh, dealing with it. Okay, so please uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, Rust supports bare metal development, okay? And it supports it to the level where of course, you can run Rust applications on an operating system with its built-in standard library, but it's got uh, a mode, okay, which is called no STD, so no standard library, that you can use to just get the core features of the language. And with that, you can write bootloaders, operating systems, and things like that. And that's the, the, the core of the support for Rust that you are getting now into the Linux kernel, uh, which is something that has been announced recently. Um, the ecosystem for embedded in Rust is thriving right now, but there are no mature real-time OSs that have been written in Rust yet. Google announced one, uh, I think, last week or something like that. They will kill it in two years anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, found that, I find that funny every, every time I, I see a Google announcement because you, you have to plan for the end, uh, end date uh, a few years ahead. Anyway, that's, that's a weird approach to product management. I've been a product manager, and I really don't understand what they are doing. Okay, um, so uh, specifically now, okay, Rust in general has support for embedded, but in our extended community, uh, we have a, a project written in Rust called Drog.io.t that I think you should pay, uh, pay attention to if you are interested in Rust. So uh, Drog.io.t is mostly from Red Hat, okay? And essentially, it has three components, Drog device, which is used to write uh, the firmware for the microcontroller, Drog Cloud, a cloud platform to go with it, and then uh, a software service to manage software updates on the devices. Drog device is based on the Embassy framework, which provides you um, a, synchronous, an, a synchronous programming framework, and uh, essentially it, it comes also with a hardware abstraction layer so that you can get true Embassy support for a wide variety of uh, hardware and boards. And um, the way this is implemented is through uh, something that resembles drivers in the abstra uh, hardware abstraction layer, although Embassy is not an OS, it's really uh, a layer in, uh, uh, in your dependencies. So, should you do Drogue IoT or not? Don't do drugs, but maybe you want to do Drogue, right? Uh, it's funny for me that Drogue IoT, I'm, I'm French speaking, right? So, Drogue is the French word for drug, uh, drugs, anyway. Uh, out of that to say, uh, in the pros, well, it's Rust, so low footprint, memory safety, thread safety, uh, as I said, that's certainly very attractive. It covers everything that you need, the device, the cloud, and the software updates. Real time is a possibility, and it supports both synchronous and asynchronous programming, depending on your preferred style or your specific needs. But for the time being, Drogue is uh, a single vendor project with external contributors. You know, Eclipse Drogue sounds nice, isn't it? I've, 
been trying to convince them. Anyway, uh, hardware support could be better. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an upstart project, so it could take some time before you get very, very massive hardware support, but it's, it's fairly good right now. And the community is small for now, but if you want to dab in it and, and see what it's all about. During Hacker Day tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, 1 p.m., we are having this Eclipse IoT activity, and part, uh, you will be provided a micro bit version 2 microcontrollers, and what you will put on those microcontrollers are uh, drug IoT applications. So if you want to see it in action, okay, uh, please, uh, please be there tomorrow. All right, and all of this, you know, I always conclude uh, all of those presentations uh, just reminding people that we do IoT at Eclipse. Uh, so, uh, well, you, you're aware of the foundation, uh, so I, I, I cut that part. But um, what we're trying to do in the Eclipse IoT Working Group is really to uh, have a comprehensive set of building blocks for IoT applications and edge computing as well. And here you see the 20-ish most popular logos or, or, or the logos of the 20-ish most popular projects out of the 50 plus we have. And as you can see, this is quite comprehensive. Okay, we are covering nearly everything, and I'm not pretending that all of it is tested together and built together and it's a seamless framework that would change your life. But still, it's all open source, it's all good, and uh, well, if you are interested in figuring out which of those components you could leverage for your own applications, well, uh, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you. And then uh, we are also busy building a comprehensive IoT Risk Five stack with something called the Open Hardware Group. So Open Hardware Group is a sister organization to the Eclipse Foundation. And what they are doing is open source processor cores and microcontrollers. And when I say open source, you literally go to GitHub and you can download the system very log, which is the source code for a CPU. This is quite awesome. I, I, I completely don't understand it. Okay, I'm not a chip designer, but the fact is you can download this, tweak it, test it, and go to a foundry and get uh, one million done for your next project. Okay, so this is really a game changer because traditionally hardware has been the domain of very, very proprietary companies. Okay, now we are bringing the open source mindset to hardware as well, and what we are trying together the Open Hardware Group and the Eclipse Foundation is to provide you the full open source stack from the microcontroller all the way to the platform in the cloud. Okay, so that's great. And so in the battle between Batman and Superman, my personal choice would have been One Punch Man. You know, uh, this is a superhero who is so bored because essentially he wins every battle in one punch and there's never a good opponent for him. So I recommend watching that if you are bored someday. Anyway, so uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to my talk and uh, putting up with our little technical difficulties on the title slide. I'm really grateful uh, for your presence. And now if we still have the time and if you have questions, uh, we can uh, try to answer them. So thank you. So any questions? So, bare metal or yes? <laughs> you mentioned that the con slide for Zenfire that has limited hardware support. Is that like for specific architectures or more? I think there's like 284 or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it's not inter. So the question is. Uh, I will repeat it since uh, for the recording. So the, the question is uh, essentially, uh, when I say that Zephyr has limited hardware support, is it because it, limit, it supports a limited number of processor architectures or because uh, the, the number of boards would be limited or something like that? Uh, it's, it's rather in terms of a number of boards because 250 sounds a lot. But when you look at the list, there are things that are not necessarily enterprise ready or, you know, uh, heavy duty. Yes, microbit is fantastic. It's supported. 
Version 1 is supported, version 2 is supported, but I wouldn't deploy that into an industrial robot, right? So it's, it's from that perspective, there are lots of boards, and, and some of them are quite enterprise ready, but some others are not. So what I want to see, and, and, and they work on it, right? They, they have very serious partners around the table, but it could be better. So I just want to flag that so that when you are not impressed by the figure, but really that you, you, you have a look at the list and you, you need to figure out, okay, is there hardware there that I would trust somebody's life to? <laughs> Yes. Uh, if you want to get a new board, for example, the table is there, it's basically just a few lines of twice this fire to get the uh, if the sock is there, right? If the sock supports it. So that is, the, that is something that could be compared between the different articles. Yeah, yeah. So the author of the question uh, commented that then uh, paying attention to the number of boards is not relevant, but rather that we should look at what system on the chips, SOCs, or at least MCUs are supported uh, by the OS, which is a, more, uh, a better measure of hardware support. That's completely uh, good, uh, a good comment. Thank you. Other questions? I'm not sure if it's directly related, but uh, in the past, uh, the, the number of uh, news about RISC V is increasing. So, do you see, say, a timeline then, like in two years or three years, so that there would be more production ready things to be used with RISC V? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the question is, um, RISC V is supported, uh, and it seems we see a trend where we will see more MCUs and even uh, production-ready boards available using the architecture. And uh, so the question is uh, whether I feel this is a true statement or not. And I think, yes, this is a true statement. Uh, and not only that, I told you about open hardware. So uh, one of the projects they have is the Core 5 MCU. So Core 5 is the name of their families of core, but the Core 5 MCU is really a production-ready, uh, validated uh, implementation of a uh, four-stage uh, processor core with all the peripherals uh, that you need uh, for simple applications, of course. Support for FreeRTOS, uh, I think there's Zephyr support as well in all of that. And uh, right now they are taking names if you are interested in uh, testing that. And they should be available by the middle of next year. Uh, it will be made in global foundries uh, in Germany, in Dresden. Uh, at least the, the core chip. Um, but of course, uh, this is still early days. So if you want a very mature ecosystem with lots of choice, then it will only be there, I would say, five years from now. But two years from now, you will see already more diversity. And one of the first important steps is the availability of the Core 5 MCU uh, somewhere, somewhere in the middle of next year. And already you can test it. Uh, we have a buff with open hardware tonight, and I will bring uh, a little FPGA board. So you can take the source code, so to speak, of the Core 5 MCU, deploy that on the FPGA board to evaluate it and, and start building applications right away. So, uh, you know, uh, depending on the timeline of a project, this, is, this could be a way to get a head start uh, with, uh, with the platform. Other questions? All right, thank you so much once again. I uh, wish you a fantastic rest of the afternoon. And if you are interested in whether we need Kubernetes in an edge computing environment, I have a second talk today at 5 p.m. in this very room. So stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs>